Welcome to the first and only Founders Fire Chat, featured on LinkedIn, where we help SaaS founders solve growth and revenue problems. Let's get started. First, let's go over the agenda. We'll do brief founder and speaker introductions, followed by a Q&A with the founders, and then we'll wrap everything up with next steps. SaaS Growth Ventures focuses on investing and scaling revenue for capital efficient SaaS companies. We are selective and invest specifically in companies where we can have a positive impact on a startup's revenue growth and increase startup valuations. My name is Thor Wood. I'm a startup founder and also entrepreneur in residence. And with me today is Artem Ghassan, general partner at SaaS Growth Ventures. He's a 10 time Ironman, four time founder with two exits and a mentor at 500 Startups and Founder Institute. Plus, Artem has invested and scaled dozens of SaaS companies to date. Thank you, Thor, for beautiful introduction. My name is Artem Gassan. I'm a general partner, as Thor mentioned, um, and my, I love helping founders to succeed by growing revenue and increasing higher valuation. As a result, we all know that the revenue is your backbone of any startup. So focusing on that can help a lot of magic happen in the future. So bottom line, I feel growth in revenue and invest in companies that are succeeding and growing there, creating the traction. Thanks, Artem. And I'm honored to introduce three amazing founders. First, we have Ganesh Gandhiaswaran, the co-founder and CEO at Conversite. We have RJ Taylor, founder and CEO at Pattern89, and Rajesh Perry and Yagen, founder and CEO at Karyosaw. And now let's hear from the founders themselves. Ganesh, could you tell us about yourself and your company in two minutes? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for this great opportunity. Great meeting you, all of you. Um, so myself, Ganesh, I'm based off Indianapolis, uh, co-founder and CEO of Converse.ai. We founded this startup B2B SaaS company in 2017. Conversite.ai, as the name says, is a conversational insights through artificial intelligence. We built an AI platform for primarily for supply chain companies who have tons of data in the name of the ERP system, CRM systems, warehouse management, lot of inventory orders, customers' products to take care of. Can we offer some help to succeed in their business by providing valuable insights? Today, it's so easy to go put all the data, dump the data in a system, but it's very difficult to get it back. What we are offering, a simple mobile platform, think of it like an Alexa for the supply chain. Our Alexa, we named Athena. Athena is an AI assistant, connect to their information. Athena is an employee in their supply chain organization, answer questions, who are their top 10 customers, which products are moving, and then alert them on any purchase orders delayed, any sales order delays. There are products which are going to expire. So proactively alert them. A very smart employee. And uh, in the last three years in the journey, we have now gained close to 78 customers, close to a million dollars in terms of the recurring revenue. We have fundraised uh, seed round middle of the pandemic last year. And we have... Um, 14-member uh, team here in Indianapolis, both sales and product team as well. So that, that's in a nutshell, what we are at. That's fantastic, Ganesh. Thank you. That uh, Amazing what, uh, uh, what you guys have been able to do uh, in basically a, a couple of years. Uh, okay, RJ, uh, in two minutes, tell us about yourself and your company. Yeah, hi, everybody. RJ Talier. I'm the CEO and founder of Pattern89. And what we do is power creative decisions for marketers, meaning somebody has to decide whether uh, a model or a stock photo has a picture of a guy in a plaid shirt or in a blue shirt. Someone has to decide whether we should have an office background or maybe a brick background, whether that model should be wearing glasses or not. And we take the human piece out of that decision-making by powering creative decisions with machine learning and predictive capabilities that help us understand what's going to perform. And we do that through a data co-op 
that now has over 6,200 brands who have connected their Facebook, Instagram, Google, Snapchat, LinkedIn, and other platforms directly into Pattern 89. We look across 49,000 different creative dimensions to figure out what's going to work. And now we power creative decisions for some of the biggest retailers in the space, for dozens of agencies. And we now have an API that allows marketers and brands, as well as platforms to pull that creative data out of Pattern 89 and into every creative decision that they make. So um, i excited to uh, be building kind of the future of creative and making humans really responsible for brand ethics and empathetic decisions rather than kind of those rote decisions that uh, machines can really help them with the recipes on. That's amazing, RJ. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Rajesh, uh, could you tell us about yourself and your company? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you clear. First of all, thanks, Thor, for inviting me to the show. I'm really honored to meet all of you once again. Um, my name is Rajesh Periyanayagam. I'm the founder and CEO of Karyosoft. At Karyosoft, we empower life scientists who are not computationally savvy to effectively manage, democratize, and transform a vast amount of genomics data into meaningful insights within their secured on-premise or cloud environment. So this is like uh, in-house secured Google for their genomics data. So yeah, as simple as that, you know, now uh, sequencing cost has dramatically reduced. Now they are generating the data. Uh, amount of data is much larger than the data stored by YouTube and Twitter. So if you want to manage that much data to get re uh, retrieve information from there, it's a very, very difficult and challenging jobs for the scientists if they don't have a computational skills. So we are making that uh, ability very easy for the clients and uh, drive the innovations in uh, ag biotech we are starting with. And also we, are, you know, we can expand to other verticals in life sciences. And we are located in Indianapolis as a Carmel, Indiana, actually. So. Awesome, awesome. Thank you uh, for sharing uh, what sounds like pretty amazing work uh, that the three of you uh, are, are working to build uh, upon and, and, and grow, um, you know, with your, uh, your customers. And it's very exciting, uh, of course, uh, the ties to Indianapolis as well. Now let's take a look at some issues, though, uh, that a lot of founders are facing today. There are some important trends to keep in mind. Most founders know how to build products but they might struggle building predictable and scalable revenue past their initial success. And at the same time, most VCs overlook companies that are not growing fast enough. And lastly, founders have access to capital, uh, but maybe they lack a predictable growth engine. But the fact is almost 70% of early stage SaaS companies will not get past a series A round of funding. But let's go a little bit deeper into the problem. More often than not, most startups concentrate on creating a business model, but ignore the importance of the revenue model. Startups face their demise while spending way too much time searching for investors, but neglecting building pipeline revenue and establishing a trust factor with customers. And most startups market their products, but they stop right there, overlooking necessary sales execution. And with that, let's dive into today's fire chat topic how to deliver value without selling. And we'll start our discussion with three questions. First, what challenges are you facing when it comes to acquiring new customers? Next, what go-to-market strategy are you currently utilizing to grow your revenue and your customer base? And last, what methods do you use today to demonstrate the value that you deliver to your customers? Let's start with you, Ganesh. What challenges are you facing today when it comes to acquiring new customers? Yeah, given that we are focusing on supply chain market and uh, that we are targeting the mid-size supply chain market. Mid-size supply chain companies think of um, manufacturing or distributors. There are a lot of distribution companies out there in Indiana. These are companies very, very lean staff, like a, you know, a director of supply chain, a warehouse manager is also staffed to take care of the technology. 
and they don't have an in-house technology team so they are super busy and they are not in any digital channels like what where we used to go like linkedin right and they don't have time to open read emails and um, you know attend all these sales phone call evaluate uh, you know out of a 50 or 100 saas companies they may call right so identifying these mid size companies um reaching them out is is kind of one of the challenge um earlier we tried linkedin ad you no know, lot of people come in but not the value you know right audience then we started um, with onboarding our own sdrs and who can make phone calls that started working so there are few ways we are uh, coming out of that but getting the right contact from these mid size companies and taking that 10 minutes out of their busiest schedule is the challenge so what have you tried you you shared so far you tried some with ten it wasn't very fruitful and now you are leveraging some sdr work to do the prospecting can you elaborate a bit more on that yeah a couple of things we are doing now is um, one we we onboarded sdr we identified cold calling is much better than emailing in this market and email like linkedin advertisement is not really helping in that segment for example so we kind of diverted the focus to okay cold call i call as many as possible <clears throat> we tried to leverage an external firm didn't work really well couldn't tell the story then we onboarded uh, a five member team this year and already booking like almost like we had like 70 meetings in last you know 30 days type so it's pouring a lot of meetings the other thing we are doing is uh, partnering with the warehouse management software or a erp company itself there are few softwares like um, i can name one um, called fishbowl inventory fishbowl inventory is um, a mid size warehouse management company and they have a lot of customers like you know thousands of customers and um, we we partnered with them we empowered a couple of them um, one company called mapack in indianapolis for example they were very successful they were able to leverage athena to get all the insights then they started telling that story to other customers now the partnership is much more thicker and we are onboarding many customers of their erp so it's easy to go say that hey, you have this erp or warehouse management system you need better insights conversite can give you that so it's like context very very clear context within that first one minute they know the problem they have the confidence that we can do it because we have done it for the same customers so the partnership and the clear message is kind of what is uh, working out for us great so couple uh, feedbacks on this uh, i've seen a lot of companies that have a fragmented market and you're operating in fragmented market as opposed to where you have the dense or hyper centric market which is okay. there's a positive and negative of that right if it would have been a very concentrated market with a lot of a lot of players would have been playing there which would have been much harder it would be easier to get in touch with people yet it would be harder to uh to demonstrate your key differentiators yeah. like that's a uh, one angle of some companies face in your case it's a fragmented market which means customers are spread between different locations they're less active on social networks as you described yeah and thirdly they don't really communicate with outside world besides of their internal team members yeah, exactly so their time spent is very limited okay mm-hmm. so uh when it comes to fragmented market you have to i'll give you a couple of reasons why this first of all is different. first of all they are fragmented just a fact the second one they don't know you yes the second the third one is they don't trust you yet mm. and the fourth okay. factor is i don't know if you can even do it successfully right so the mm. first most important when market is fragmented you want to treat every single customer as your friend mm. you're not looking for a customer you should look for a friend because you will get both eventually or you will get one or another yeah the second rule is it's a, it's a it's a go to market strategy that been used as many years bottom up approach and the best way as you described is you having your existing customers and the case studies and testimonials everything about what you've done for them how did you treat them 
will give them the sense, can, do they know you? Because they know that potential, you know, that company, they might be in, visit them at the conference, so they come across, they always interconnect somehow. So if you created the value to a friend of mine, then I know I'll trust it, friend of friend. Make yeah, sense? Yeah. When you yeah. reach out, do not reach out to sell. Reach out to build relationships. I'll explain what the, per the difference is. Right? Most people try to close transaction and try to get the money, which is obvious, and you immediately go into that stage. As opposed to reaching out to them for a sales call, you're reaching out to do some sort of a collaboration. What kind of form of collaboration can it be? And I'll, I'll provide you after our uh, fire chat more examples of how that was done for other companies how I help companies to do this, but the principle is to reach out to them and provide the value, instant value. The value is created where you ask their opinion on something. That could be a case study. That could be them sharing something that's gonna get exposed publicly or become a public level. In other words, where you're stroking their ego and you're also highlighting what they've done and they get to speak about themselves. When they express an opinion, then, then you're listening and you create the formal content. That could be a blog post, it could be a podcast, whatever the form. There's many other forms to make that happen. But eventually, that is your first step. You're reaching out to build relationship and get their opinion to speak on a specific topic. Step yep. one. Nice. Step two, you produce that content, whatever that content is. Step yep. three, you take that content and when you go reach out to other lookalike people, you're referencing that you've done this and you've done this with what customer, potential customer A or B, using their name, the title, the credit, potential credibility to attract additional individuals to repeat the same cycle. That becomes predictable. One attracts another, the second attracts the third, etc. Does that make sense? Yep. That, that's called the stage, I will know you. That's all it is. You have, they have to know you yeah. first. The, the second stage, I need to trust you. It's how they're going to see, they're going to work with you. I call this micro uh, projects or tasks. It allows them to work with you in short period of time or the matter, let's say, two phone calls to learn how you produce this result. How did you treat them during this process? Are you respectful? Are you kind? Are you, are you sincere? Are you providing the value? Are you asking for money? Right? They're going to smell that you're going to try to use this as a method to sell versus not. Once, yeah. once you deliver the value, you will see that they will share this. You will see that they will promote you without even you being paying, you're paying for this advertising or marketing. Right? They, you're doing cross-promotion. Yeah. Then, on your stage four, stage three, you demonstrate what you can do is by sharing them a case study and a hard moment of what other people achieve. And that is your demo at that point. Yeah. When you're trying to go direct sale, the only way, it's, yes, it will produce you, I'll call them marginal result, meaning one or two, threes, but the cost of direct sale, it's just too early. That's it. When I when I see something, somebody starts to do you know cold calling. Yes, it, you will get appointments, but necessary. You still have to work on those three factors. I don't know you. I don't trust you, and I don't know if you can do it. Sure. Does that make sense? So it's yeah. at the end, a lot of times they will listen to what you're saying. You show the demo, and then they again they will not move forward a lot of times not at the super high rate, simply because they like, I understand what you're showing me, but you are promising a lot of points without demonstrating this. Like it's case study typically, it's a testimonials, it's a, it's a use case, it's a storytelling yes. of someone they know. That's how you create the density. And as a result, you build the trust to yourself and you reach out to them as a friend. That's, yep. the, that's the strategy for fragmented businesses. Hopefully it was valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great, great for sure. Thank you for sharing. Very good, very good. Um, RJ, uh, how about you? Uh, what challenges are you facing today uh, on the uh, acquisition front for customers? Well, you know, the, the biggest challenge that I have is, well, there, there's actually two. One is that there is just so many marketing applications out there. I had a, a customer describe it as, 
They didn't want AFL, another freaking login. Um, they use co more colorful language than that. Um, and then the second is um, around the disbelief in AI in general. And is it, you know, super hyped or is it real? And so, you know, we've addressed both of those challenges through some of the things that um, you were just mentioning, Artem, in terms of um, driving some entertainment content, making sure to go to pilots, as well as um, offering our API to integrate to their existing applications. Um, and um, on the, the, the kind of the provability of AI, we really, our, our primary go-to-market is by doing some sort of pilot and um, we win 80% of those pilots, but there's a huge amount of disbelief on, you know, or it's disbelief combined with, um, wait, how is this going to intersect or overlap or overtake some of the human processes that we already have set up? So um, we typically find that we can work out those kinks in a, some sort of pilot or um, short-term contract before moving into a longer one. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one. And mm -hmm. it takes time. I'm sure you realize this as well. Um, help me understand why. Have they shared with you what was the underlying reason they believe? Are they skeptical that that their team will do a better job than AI? Or they mm -hmm. believe that AI will displace their employees? Or there are other reasons? Well, I, I think that it um, is, is a little bit of everything, to be to totally honest with you. And I think each organization operates a little bit different. In some cases, they think um, that uh, we, we reach a gatekeeper or somebody who's thinking, you know, I've just established my standard operating procedure and I'm not going to change this SOP because of some new tech. The second um, is because of fear that I'm worried that something's going to do this better than me. Awesome. And if the machine does this, then what do I do? What is my job? In yep. fact, I'm the person who's created this SOP around this um, outdated process. Um, and then the third is around um, the explainability challenge with AI in general, which is if it's a black box, then let's say it makes a mistake. I as a human am responsible for this thing that I don't really understand. And a lot of our customers are marketers and like me, they have liberal arts degrees. They're not uh, data engineers or data scientists. So they're trying to understand how to explain this mistake or this opportunity to um, their boss. And um, it's, so yeah, I, I can go into some examples that um, we've learned from and those that we've kind of gotten through. But um, I think that those are the three types of big challenges that we see from um, from the adoption of AI and, um, um, you know, kind of that fear, natural evolution, um, those types of things. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I, I, it's some, some is a pattern 89 challenge. Some is an industry problem because of AI explainability. Um, and, um, you know, I think that the, the, the last year has actually really accelerated the adoption of technologies like ours because as marketers look to get more efficient, of course, that's super important, but then also um, they're adopting new tech um, because they're forced to. Um, and they need to know that every dollar that they spend has some sort of um, tangible result. And that's you know something that we can give them that others can't. Thank you for sharing this. It's definitely uh, a different a different challenge, yeah. uh, a different challenge. And I'll summarize this. So as you share that your potential customers are afraid or unsure how successful they AI will be. And that you should acknowledge this and say, this is totally valid. Yeah. I 100% agree. That's the reason we started the company. Mm -hmm. We've been in the same shoes before. Mm -hmm. We understand why it happened. And I've seen here's why it led to have an AI, right? Given the story. So that's a one suggestion. So explain that you are, you are on their side. Mm -hmm. The reason it exists today, because I personally faced this problem or my customers faced this problem. And they all started with the exact same hypothesis that humans have a better control over the outcomes or decisions than AI. I agree with that. So what you try to the second stage of that, you offer them or you provide them guidance that this is not, 
it's augmented. It's a mm. complementary. It's not a displacement. People right. are afraid to change. People are afraid why they're afraid. Because if it doesn't work, they can lose their job. They can lose their reputation. Mm-hmm. Or they will not earn their bonuses, whatever that is. Right? They're afraid of going outside of the comfort zone. And when they brought in something and they were hired to do a specific role or implementation, somebody like you come in and say, well, I think you missed something. And that can be offensive to them. They're afraid that uh, they will look not the best way in front of their bosses. Mm-hmm. So you have to you have to say you I am on your side. I understand this. And I've seen this. And what you're doing is correct way for today. But for the future, it has to change if you want to achieve ROI. Mm-hmm. So third component, you demonstrate ROI, say, hey, if you do this manually, I'm not saying you should displace this. I don't think you should replace the people. You should augment and help them to focus on more strategic, high-level execution pieces or more important pieces like finding the outcomes or delivering the design, whatever whatever the outcome they focus on where a machine cannot do this. Mm-hmm. And demonstrate how much time it can save their team as a result of that tangible item, which is called time, can be transferred to other priorities. Yeah. Right? As a result... They can focus on helping their customers. They can focus on delivering results. They can do better and faster. At the same time, you have a quality control mechanism, which mm-hmm. allows you to monitor and ensure that AI gives you the right stuff. Fourth component, very, very important, mm-hmm. is your type of customer that you're working with. The companies who are um, that will adopt this better and faster is the organization that has a higher frequency. Mm-hmm. Higher frequency has higher room for error. So yeah. humans can do a good job like um, when, when they recreate one day. Like we can we can polish this, we can make it perfect, we can look at from all those angles and we create this, whatever this item is, right? But when we have to manufacture those items, humans tend to make human errors. Mm-hmm. Because we miss something, we forget, we got distracted, we got tired, we got family conflicts, whatever those reasons are. As a result, the contain this all this manufacturing production starts to lag the time, uh, human errors, and challenges occur. That's the pain points. So you have to find a customer that has a higher frequency. The more more often they do this job, mm-hmm. the more often the error can occur. Now you demonstrate consequences, last component. What is the cost of stopping the manufacturing production of not being able to find it or not delivering on time? There is a consequence. Yeah. Consequence always costs more than yeah. our lives, right? So then as you say, hey, that's the reason why we've created this. It's your job to connect dots from A to Z. They can't comprehend all those details. By connecting those little elements from one point to another, we're not going to interfere with your process, which is going to augment this. We know that the reason is because your frequency is high. When you have high frequency, then people can make an error. As a result, it's going to have consequences of loss of this, time, money, and ROI at the end is more effective to do this way. Mm-hmm. Just think about how the AWS transitioned a lot of organizations to cloud. People were skeptical. They want to control. They want to make security, comply. They had much more issues. This only works for organizations where you have a high frequency of mm-hmm. their case servers, instances, in your case, frequency of using the API. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I love, I love that framework as well. Thanks. Awesome, awesome. And uh, Rajesh, uh, what are you facing uh, challenge-wise uh, with acquiring new customers? Certainly. See, our market is basically a 12 to 13 years old market because of the uh, next generation sequencing technologies. So the focus initially was more on how cheaply we can sequence uh, genome. Because imagine that 20 years back, we see we spent $1.2 billion to sequence one human genome. But now you can sequence the same human genome for less than $1,000. So imagine the magnitude difference. So the focus was heavily on 
that piece but now data becomes surplus you know huge amount of data like i told you it's more than youtube and twitter right so now what to do with the data is the trend it is starting right now and everybody is feeling the pressure on that so the dynamics is uh, because that uh, initial focus was on how effectively we can uh, sequence the genome that requires a lot of computational skills so this uh, um, uh, the skill set for mining the data uh, uh, with the computational skill became necessary so there are some analysts only who have that capacity but our end users are the scientists right so they don't have the skill so now because of that separation if we go and offer them okay this data can be easily accessed to them or something uh, you can do the work uh, more effectively there is a big gap in there scientists are used to asking somebody or having the fear that this is a computation intensive work i cannot do that fear they are living in right now so we have to break that and then give them hey this is easy it's not as bad as what you think it is easy to give uh, you can do the work faster when we are doing that that is really challenging if you take in any uh, company what happens is the analyst group they feel scared if we go that we are making the job easier so then we are in trouble they can play a saboteur role you know and then the biologists who wanted to use, even if they like it decision making gets a little delayed mainly because they have to get the approval from the analyst group and then they have to get the blessings so this type of complex dynamics is a challenge for us to get make the decision making faster especially on the industry side that is one of them and then another one is and then data types also there is a complexity there it's not we are targeting only one data type of uh, six different data types so when we go to somebody and then we show them okay this is not uh, for us we are using a different data type you know so that is these are the two common challenges i face when i uh, uh, to get a new customers thank you rajesh so help me understand this and correct me if i'm wrong the way i understood this is that you have two types of individuals one is an analyst and another one is a scientist A scientist is an individual who uses the product. An analyst is the decision maker. Financial is he or she decision financial decision maker. No, decision maker typically on the biology side, but they won't make the decision unless they get the blessings from the analyst. Correct. So you have three different personas. Yeah, <laughs> person who's using it, person who is. Uh, Uh, doing sign off on this and another person writes the check yes well you have to address all three unfortunately okay. there's no way around this and because of that because of those three chat the three individuals most likely your price point has to go up just the reality right because of them uh, the way they do the decision um what you need to find out and maybe you can clarify what do the analysts care the most what is their job what's their responsibility what are they accountable for what are they measuring what basically why is it important for them to adapt your solution i mean see that uh, for them uh, like i mentioned uh, see the workflow angle when you see them uh, that the the raw data that comes out of the mission is uh, complex so they are the only one who can bring put the to- data together and then uh, meaning uh, mean, make a meaning of the data right Understood. so once it is there then the mining is the one biologist work like that that's where we are focusing on that but that point that needs to be exactly conveyed to them hey it is not going to affect your job you know it's going to make it win win for both of you like that that is a challenge part <laughs> understood thank you for clarifying this so it's clear now that one person one types of people use the product and all the types of people take the data analyze the data and present to the biologist yeah okay what you want to do is sell them i call this reporting advanced reporting and i'm sure you have it. and if that advanced reporting can help them summarize conclude draw analysis whatever that is then it's easier for them to present this 
they can you help them do their job better, faster, and more efficiently. So it's all for them. It's reporting and data uh, analysis. And sooner you can provide this analysis, you can demonstrate to them like here's the beautiful. It's all about visualization. And it's all about the richness of the data that you can provide to them. This way, they analyze in their mind how much time would it take me to gather that data. They know that answer in their mind. And I'm sure they're fast. They can do their job fast. But if you can help them say hours of hours in this reporting, then that becomes a value offering to them. You have three different, unfortunately, three different value offerings. One for the um, scientist, one for analyst, and one for biologist. You have to break it down to all three. Yes. You probably to have to complement all three, of course, at the end of the day. And that's kind of like, you know, it's trying to sell the CRM, the end user is the sales people, but the CRO likes to look at the charts. It's kind of the same thing. And yes. when you show them the beautiful reports, beautiful charts, data, insights, whatever that is, even though you have to do this partially manually, offload some of the work. That's what's going to give them moment, that does give them confidence that this is worth buying or testing or using it because you help them to do their job better. Exactly. But it's not an ROI specifically, it's time saving and richness of the information. And visualization. Yes. It, it plays a big role in there. Right. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, question number two, and and we'll, and going on to number three. I know we've got about twenty minutes here, and I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. Uh, so we'll we'll go kind of rapid, a little more rapid fire um, on number two and number three. So uh, let's start with RJ. What go to market strategy are you currently utilizing to to really grow that customer base uh, and, and by extension the revenue? Yeah. Well, th there the the thing that we that we have that's so um, uh, interesting to our prospective customers is we have this giant data set that tracks over 6,200 brands. So we can identify what's creative that's trending up and trending down. For example, right now, the creative featuring intimate photos, like people kissing and hugging and holding hands, the click-through rates on content like that is up 165% as compared to last month. Um, we track everything from colors to all sorts of creative dimensions so we can guide those marketers on what decisions they should make. So um, a great go-to-market for us is to publish those findings through PR, as well as creative forecasts, and then also use that same data within our customer set to drive more engagement in ways that you can use our data. So it's really putting our data co-op to work and identifying those trends and publishing that out of the world that drives people to download content from our site and then start the conversation with us. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with that point. Every company has a lot of data. That data is super valuable. And because it's across multiple customers, you're sitting on tangible very valuable information. Taking this and creating different types of content. What I mean by that is you can create a blog post, you can create the infographic, you can create PDF, you can create video. You recycle and you use this and you create micro snippets of a content that you spray everywhere as possible. Whenever people find it, search it, it's always available. And sharing this on, so newsletters is one of the best ones, even though it's a very old method. But it works very well because it gets delivered right to the person inbox and you're giving them examples. And then you ask them as a result, because you're ready to reach out, you don't have to wait for the click through rate to happen. You reach out to your potential or current existing customers, send them this information and ask them, what else would they missing? What else would they like to learn? Give them that asset that you have in a digital form. What else would you be interested in? What kind of narration are you looking for? And that gives you the feedback to learn more, and then you leverage this information again and again and again in micro content form. Love it. Very good. Uh, Rajesh, uh, you want to hit on this one? Uh, you know, your go to market strategy, uh, you know, to grow your revenue and your customer base. Sounds good. So, our market is entirely whole life sciences. Uh, because yeah, sequencing is happening everywhere. But uh, we are starting with the ag biotech industry. That's the first step, mainly because my domain, I'm from that domain. 
So even in that one, we have four types like uh, industry, academia, institutes, and federal entities like that. But we are initially starting with my known contacts in uh, industry first, uh, because I've been in this industry for quite some time. So initially, we are giving our platform to the known contacts in uh, industry and also in uh, institute. Uh, both of them we are giving, and then that's where we are growing slowly. And then from there, we plan to go to uh, other verticals where I don't have a knowledge much on the pharma side, but I'm bringing in people who have a knowledge in that domain, so we can go from there. So that is the funnel. We are starting at the bottom and then going to the top that way. And then eventually, we have a plan to go to healthcare as well, because that's where the genomics is very, very beginning stage. So our early partnership in that domain will take us to a long way, we think. So that is what we are going as a plan A, plan B, plan C, like that we are going. Uh, you brought a good point, Rajesh. Uh, I would just extend on what you're doing already. Uh, taking advantage, not just the Institute and University, but professors, and then taking what I've shared already uh, for um, RJ about microcompany. Microcondom is very powerful. Mm -hmm. so, for example, you have some data, some statistics, some results, maybe institute done it, maybe students done it, whatever that is. Taking this information, complementing with um, professor opinion, for example, or anyone, uh, thought leader, uh, industry expert, someone who the industry trusts, creating video microcondom, some form of it, and publishing this and repeating this again. Yes. Same principle. Certainly, yes. Well done. And uh, Ganesh, uh, do you want to tackle this one now? Uh, your go-to-market strategy with uh, growing revenue and, and uh, your customer base. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, like we kind of tried a couple of different markets. So what we have now is we clearly segmented the market, mid-size, the larger, right? So mid-size, we are going after mostly a partner-driven approach, fixed couple of partners. We we have integrated with close to like 15 different ERP systems, like NetSuite, so Fishbowl Inventory, to Oracle, some of that, right? So mid-size, we kind of profile, okay, these are the ERPs they're using, okay, partner with them and go to the market. So and two things. Number one, we know whom to reach, which one to reach. Second is that onboarding time is short. Like we exactly know how that system is connected. And then... Mid to large is more LinkedIn advertisements. So that's another thing. So we produce some great demos and a um, lot of great articles around the real problem, right? There is, for example, in, in the supply chain right now, with all this e-commerce growth happening, traditionally, like I was talking to a manufacturing company a um, week back, they used to get a purchase order for 10,000 quantities, like from a large retailer six months ahead of time. Now they're getting an e-commerce order with three days cycle time, right? That means they need much more better forecasting system. Instead of retailer carrying the inventory, the manufacturing company need to carry the inventory. This is a big problem they are struggling with today. So going and talking to them with a good video, good white paper on this is the problem and how you solve that, right? And where we are coming in. So talking about more the problem and uh, why you need to solve and how an AI technology can solve. And then finally, Converse could be a choice, kind of a, an approach we are going to that larger, mid to large segment. So more pointed, partner-led, driven partner -led solution is a more larger a solution approach. Driven. That's kind of what we are doing um, Kind of okay so far, um, bringing all you know good amount of leads and customers for us. There's definitely um, a can be fruitful channel. It might consume some time, and it does. It's a long tail approach uh, to reach out to them, always nurture this relationship, and making them do something for you is going to take some time. But if you see this now, then the fruits will come yeah. later. Uh, it just uh, be mindful about the time you spend on this. Right. Yeah, that's kind of why we are focusing on some of these partner-led where we can, you know, week over week, we can continue to close the leads and customers and, and then start seeding the little bit larger ones. 
So we can start seeing that. Yeah. One suggestion I might have for you is um, there are organizations who do uh, press releases on the market, for example, supply chain. There's literally, there's a, there's a small uh, um, research, market research boutique firms. And then, of course, there's governments of the world and forest in the world. The small organizations always reach out to individuals like yourself to gather the insights about the specific market or industry. Mm. Providing them with that insight or your perspective, yeah. they can untap kind of double opportunities. First of all, they can give you reports for free, potentially. Uh, you can take some of that data and reuse this as your content, micro content, what, whatnot. But working with them, they, they have their own databases of individuals who they send those reports and who purchase those reports. Really, your relationship with this market research firms could be key here to unlock some of the opportunities because you give the value to them as a result, they can give you additional value. Again, it's a, it's a long tail approach. It takes some time, um, but that's something to consider. Got it, got it. Yep. Awesome. And we're on to the, the final question. Uh, we'll start with uh, Rajesh on this one. What methods are you using today uh, to demonstrate value uh, to your customers? Sure, happy to. So currently what we are doing is uh, our model is, uh, uh, like I said, uh, we are reaching out to our known contacts and then bring them for the demo first. And then once we give the demo, we give an offer for uh, evaluation a month or something and before they close the sale. That is the our pipeline. So the, va the value, what we, the way we are doing is during the demo, I go through four or five slides that, add, that, that shows the pain point and uh, engage in the conversation. Say these are the uh, various pain points we gathered from the field, from prior clients. What do you think? Are you facing the same thing in your institution also? Then they will give some feedback. Some we keep adding, that is the way we are maturing our slide and then what value it can give. These are the uh, uh, values our platform proven to give value to prior some of the clients. What do you think? Are you adding new or is it the same? So that, that is the way we are having an engaging conversation with them. Then I give a, a demo of our platform technically. So when we go through that, well, this is very easy. You know, th that, that type of with a, some two, three use case scenario I just uh, rotate hey, how easily you can get the patentable discovery, you know, how much efficiency it can add. Now all of them, that type of story I spin it. That is a new learning. Earlier I was just giving as a platform. Later I started adding the case studies in my demo. Then after that we will follow up and then go from that step. That is the current one, which is going very well so far, but this one caveat is that this is only when the demo happens, right? right? When demo don't happen, how do I get them to you know, bring it to demo? That is a different story, okay? That is through, again, known contacts. And then we uh, ask somebody, can you connect to somebody else? You know, it goes from them to bring you to the demo. So that is what we are currently doing uh, for this particular, this is my answer to your particular question. Now, I'm glad that you were just focusing on not features and benefits, but you're showing the case study and examples how your customers had a chance to use your product. Now take it to the next level. Once you start showing what the problem, they had the problem, why they had this problem, how long they had this problem, basically quantify the problem as much as you can in that demo so mm -hmm. they can relate to this. Then demonstrate financial consequences or cost of doing it, I call this before and after, okay? Yeah. Then you demonstrate financial impact of this, loss of money, loss of time, whatever the form of that is. And then you, you take it to the next level, which is lack of visibility. Reporting, visibility. So this way you relate this to an analyst. And then you put the cherry on top. Ah. Show them, aha moment or what your customer learned something that was not obvious. Everybody has an aha moment. And it's typically something I never believe 
I was able to do this. I never thought it made my job easier. It actually helped me to find things that I only wish for. That's an emotional context. People want to be part of that emotional context again. And you are, the person is going to guide them through this path to show them aha moment. Instant gratification. Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. That is good. Uh, Ganesh, uh, what, what methods are you using today uh, to demonstrate value? Yeah, I think very similar. Showing the benefit what our existing customers are getting. Um, you know, that's definitely the best one. And we also made a couple of good videos with our customers speaking testimony and sharing. Most importantly, what was the life without Athena, with Athena, and what benefits getting it? And, um, you know, most of our you know, customers, they, Athena is their employee. So when they say that Athena is their employee and uh, from morning to evening, how Athena is helping them in their day-to-day -day business. And, um, you know, for one customer, for example, we started with them 2018, end of 18. Now, like the ROI they have reached, like the, the you know, Forex growth in revenue and then still managing with a yeah, two to three member team of all the hundreds of additional customers because of the power of Athena, that was powerful. Right? And then same thing with, for example, tomorrow we have uh, a large webinar for a partner company along with that. So hundreds of um, potential prospects coming in and we have one of our customers coming and sharing what they are doing. So when they are telling their story of success, we are going, just going to show them that how this platform work. So more than concentrating on what we have to offer, rather how it's helping our customers. That's kind of what we are focusing on. That is in the form of video, that's in the form of case study, that's in the form of slides everywhere. So that's kind of what we are doing. Now you've touched a good point, is let your customers tell their stories and to your yeah. customers. Works the best, you don't have to sell. Yeah. Well, initially you can eliminate the barrier of, I don't trust you, Yeah. I don't know you. It's let your customers to break that. Uh, also, also, the other thing is in this market, right? So we had um, a webinar with, um, you know, close to 50 companies in India now, like manufacturing companies, small, mid-sized manufacturing. Most of them said only the thing, right? Oh, AI, we can't afford it. We don't have the talent, right? So when we go show a smaller company of in that space that oh, they have done it, I can do it. So confidence, trust both ways. One is, can I trust this company? The other is also that, yes, they, they can do it. They don't need to have an army of people with AI scale, and it's not millions of dollars. They can still do it. That confidence is also there. I would agree with everything you said. Doing it more would be the next step. Yeah. That is awesome. Uh, RJ, you want to bring us home on this one? Uh, what methods are uh, you using to, to showcase and demonstrate uh, value? Yeah, the, the big one that we've invested in is just putting it right into the product. And so that every time you click a button within Pattern 89, you can see the result. And um, that result is very quantifiable because every action that we influence is tracked on the internet. So we can show you how many incremental purchases or how many incremental app downloads or eyeballs or video views or whatever the metric is um, you generated as a result of taking an action within Pattern 89. And that's been um, really great to link the, you know, what, what you're doing versus the result of that action. So that's been a good uh, thing just to put it right into the product to uh, remove any sort of doubt. That's a great point that you've touched. Is about is, is part of the product like growth strategies. And one component of that is, as, as I'm kind of repeating myself again, that every product, every company has a lot of valuable data. Having this data demonstrate as part of your product how is what allows to target new customers. They're gonna see two things. They're gonna see the data, which is valuable to them. And they're going to see how the product works. 
all it is is just combining those two things and showing them. Right? We always have this challenge, like showing the demo. I want to show, get on the call, show the demo. You don't have to go through this micro step. You can have a video or you can have a blog post or any other form to show these pieces of how the product works. And here's the result. Product works, here's the result. Here's how it works. You're basically putting this online so people self educate. And whenever they see this again and again and again, there will be a point of time when they will see those micro have moments that will lead them to like, I want to have it. I'm missing that little piece. Then it's easier for them to sell the whole package or the whole product. But initially, they need a small piece of it. And constantly giving them little pieces like that, small micro count. We're talking about one, two minute content is what the key here. All right, gentlemen, uh, listen, fantastic q and I really appreciate your participation. Uh, it's interesting to see how each of you are approaching things. Um, and of course, Artem, uh, you know, contributing some insights on the customer acquisition side, revenue growth, uh, you know, value delivery. Um, let's see here. So uh, just to kind of wrap it all up, uh, today we learned how to streamline the sales process and acquire new customers faster. We discussed different go-to-market strategies, and we really talked about different methods of, of how to demonstrate value to your customers. Now, to close things out, thank you, of course, to the panel. Uh, again, you're amazing. Uh, glad to have you be a part of the Founders Fire Chat. I'll be following up with each of you with an email, uh, with introductions, and, and providing the, the uh, full edited episodes uh, with highlights uh, from today's discussion so you can share it on social networks or with uh, within your SaaS founder community network. Uh, and of course, if you have any suggestions on how to improve forthcoming Founders Fire Chat episodes, please do let me know. Your feedback and suggestions are always welcome as we look to provide as much value to other founders uh, as possible. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed this Founders Fire Chat. This show exists for and because of you. So please click on the like or insightful button and share the Founders Fire Chat on LinkedIn or Facebook. And let's work together in developing this community and setting new SaaS global standards. My name is Thor Wood, founder of Snapshift, an entrepreneur in residence with SaaS Growth Ventures. If you'd like to be a part of Founders Fire Chat, send an email to Thor at SaaSGrowthVentures.com or DM me on LinkedIn. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.